Genesis chapter 3. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, He shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together, and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam, and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked. And I hid myself. And he said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? And the man said, The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, the serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, Cursed is the ground for thy sake, and sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return unto the ground. For out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. And Adam called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothed them. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man is become as one of us to know good and evil. And now, lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man, and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims, and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. R.J. from Florida. What scriptures refer to the doctrine of the serpent seed? I cannot find this in the Bible. Well, it's certainly there. It's the first, it's the first prophecy in the Bible, basically. It's Genesis chapter 3, verses 14 and 15, where Christ says to the serpent, I will put enmity between thy seed and the woman's seed. So that is the serpent's seed. But the serpent means the glistening one. That's one of Satan's names. Well, how do you know it's one of Satan's names? Well, have you, have you ever read uh, Revelation chapter 12, verse 6 and 7, that old devil, the serpent? 
or Revelation chapter 20, cast in the abyss, the old devil, the serpent, uh, Lucifer. Uh, the word Lucifer is not there, but it, that means the bright morning star. He tries to claim everything that Christ is, only he's a fraud. Christ. The purpose of this video is to teach nine proofs of the serpent seed doctrine. We want to give a disclaimer that this video series contains mature subjects like adultery, human reproduction, and so forth. Parental guidance is certainly encouraged. Before we teach the nine proofs, we want to summarize the doctrine of the serpent seed for those unfamiliar with it. The word serpent seed come from God's own words in Genesis 3.15. So God is the one who originated this truth that the serpent had seed or offspring or children. Here's how God's words about the serpent having seed or offspring should be understood. The forbidden fruit that Eve partook of in Genesis 3.6 was an act of sexual adultery with the serpent, not a literal apple as many erroneously believe. Proverbs 30 verse 20 and Song of Solomon 5.1 clearly teach that eating can be symbolic of sexual relations. Such is the way of an adulterous woman. She eateth and wipeth her mouth, and saith, I have done no wickedness. I am come into my garden, my sister, my spouse. I have gathered my myrrh with my spice. I have eaten my honeycomb with my honey. I have drunk my wine with my milk. Eat, O friends, drink, yea, abundantly, O beloved. After partaking of the fruit of adultery with the serpent, Eve conceived a child from the seed of the serpent, which is why God later recognized that the serpent had seed or offspring in Genesis 3.15. Genesis 3.6 stated that after Eve partook of the fruit, she went and shared that fruit with Adam, meaning she had sexual relations with Adam after she had relations with the serpent. Eve then received the seed of Adam and conceived again. Now Eve had two different seeds growing inside her from these two sex acts, the seed of the serpent and the seed of Adam, which two seeds God himself recognized, and later the two seeds resulted in two sons, Cain and Abel, from two different fathers. Cain's father was the serpent, and Abel's father was Adam. So the story of the fall of mankind by the first and original sin in Genesis chapter 3 verses 1 to 6 has two symbols that are not to be understood literally, which are the eating of fruit and the two trees. The eating of fruit was symbolic of sexual intercourse, according to Proverbs 30 verse 20, 2 Corinthians 11 verses 2 and 3, Song of Solomon chapter 4 verses 12, all the way to chapter 5 verse 1, and Romans 7 verses 1 to 5. A fruit is the end result of a seed, and the serpent's lie to Eve that she would not surely die if she partook of the fruit was a spiritual seed or thought that was planted in her mind. That liar seed that was planted in her mind eventually came into fruition and produced the fruit of an adulterous act with the serpent, which God recognized by stating that the serpent's seed would have hatred against the woman's seed. Eve partook of this fruit with the serpent and then shared it with Adam, who also partook of the fruit, as mentioned earlier. The two trees in the midst of the garden, known as the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil, were symbolic of the two spirits of Jesus and Satan. These two trees were not literal trees like all the other trees in the garden, as we will explain soon in this video. We will now teach on nine proofs of the serpent seed doctrine. Proof number one of the serpent seed is, the Bible supports the serpent seed doctrine from Genesis to Revelation. Moses, Jesus, St. Paul, St. Peter, and St. John all supported the serpent seed doctrine through their teachings. Moses, of course, was the author of the book of Genesis and recorded Genesis 3.15 in which God himself said that the serpent had a seed or offspring, which we can prove to be Cain, for he was of that wicked one, according to 1 John 3, verse 12. The Lord Jesus himself taught the serpent seed doctrine in Matthew chapter 13, verses 24 to 30 and verses 36 to 43. In this parable, Jesus described the children of God as good seed, while the children of the wicked one, Satan, were tares or bad seed, according to verse 38. The parable, which has numerous applications, teaches that two different men, or sowers, planted two different seeds in one field. 
The two men then represent God and Satan, and the field represents the world. This parable also helps reveal the origin from the Garden of Eden of the two kinds of children, the children of God and the children of the devil. Two men, Adam and the serpent, planted their seeds in one field or one woman, Eve. The seeds or offspring grew up and manifested their different natures. Cain, the son of the serpent, slew righteous Abel, for Cain was of the cursed seed. St. Paul supported the serpent seed doctrine in 2 Corinthians 11, verses 2 and 3, by directly comparing the virginity of the church in Corinth to Eve's virginity when she was presented to Adam. Paul said it was his desire to present the Corinthians as a chaste virgin or spiritual virgin to Christ. Then Paul went on to say that he feared the minds of the Corinthians would be corrupted and they would lose their spiritual virginity just as the serpent corrupted the mind of Eve and she lost her spiritual virginity and also her physical virginity. For God said she had two different seeds immediately after she partook of the fruit and shared it with Adam. St. Peter supported the serpent seed doctrine in 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 4 stating that corruption was in the world through lust, which is the desire for that which is forbidden. We see the Bible teaches that Eve lusted after the fruit of adultery, as also taught by Genesis 3.16, in which God declares the consequences of Eve's sin, one of which was that Eve's desire would now be to her husband. This means that Eve's desire was not to her husband, Adam, before God gave this consequence, but her lustful desire was to the serpent, who gave Eve of his own seed. St. John supported the serpent seed doctrine in 1 John chapter 3, verses 6-15. to 15. We have already mentioned verse 12 in this video, but we will again point out that the Holy Spirit said Cain was of the wicked one, and we know Adam was not the wicked one. For the phrase wicked one always refers to Satan, as Jesus called Satan the wicked one twice in Matthew 13, verses 19 and 38, and St. John mentioned the wicked one three other times in his same letter, chapter 2, verses 13 and 14, and chapter 5, verse 18. And each time it meant Satan, not Adam. Cain even had his own separate genealogy that is separate from Adam's in Genesis 4, verses 17 to 24, as Adam's genealogy is in Genesis chapter 5, verses 1 to 32. Adam's genealogy stated that Seth was in the image and likeness of Adam. But the Bible never says that Cain was in the image and likeness of Adam. Furthermore, the Bible states that Eve was the mother of all living in Genesis 3.20. But Scripture never says that Adam was the father of all living because he was not. The serpent was the father of Cain, and Eve was indeed the mother of Cain. Proof number two of the serpent seed is... The two trees in the midst of the Garden of Eden were not literal trees because the tree of knowledge of good and evil was not good for food. In Genesis 2 verse 9, the Bible said that every tree out of the ground was good for food. This proves that the tree of knowledge of good and evil was not a regular tree because when Eve partook of it, it caused sin and death. The tree of knowledge in good and evil was not good for food like every other tree of the Garden. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Since sin and death came from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, it could not have been good by any means. Any tree that will kill you is not good for food. Thus, we can say two things about the tree of knowledge of good and evil. First, it did not come from the ground. Second, its fruit was not good for food. This proves that the tree of knowledge of good and evil was not a physical tree, but a spiritual tree, the evil spirit of Satan. The two trees in the midst of the garden were symbolic of the two spirits of Jesus and Satan. In fact, we believe these two trees are still available today. Both the spirit of Jesus and the spirit of Satan offer fruits or human actions that can be experienced by humans, just as Adam and Eve experienced in the Garden of Eden. Eve was deceived into eating the fruit of adultery off the tree of the spirit of Satan, just as Hosea rebuked Israel for eating the fruit of lies from Satan's spirit in Hosea chapter 10, verse 13. Any sinful act is a fruit of Satan. On the contrary, any act of godly obedience and righteousness is a fruit of the Holy Spirit, or the Spirit of Jesus Christ. 
So we now see that we may choose to eat of either spiritual tree, worldly knowledge, or words of eternal life, which leads to our third proof. Proof number three of the serpent seed is, the tree of life was Jesus Christ, not a natural tree, because there is only one way to eternal life. The tree of life could not have been a normal fruit-bearing tree, such as a pear or olive tree. For if it was, then there would have been a second, works-based way to inherit eternal life. But we know there is only one way to eternal life, and that is through Jesus Christ, who said He was the way and the life, the only way to eternal life. According to Jesus Christ Himself, He is the life, the bread of life, with the words of eternal life. There is only one way to eternal life, through Christ, the person of life. There cannot be numerous ways to receiving eternal life. If the tree of knowledge of good and evil was just a literal tree with literal apples, and so was the tree of life just a literal tree with literal fruit, then that means one could have received eternal life by eating literal fruit. We do not believe one could receive eternal life by eating a literal fruit because God never saved anyone by using that physical method. But we believe one could receive eternal life by the same way God has always offered it, spiritually receiving it by grace through faith in God's plan of salvation. Most people, then, believe that there are two ways to receive eternal life in the Bible. Way number one is by faith through grace in the finished work of God's salvation plan. Or, spiritually speaking, we must be partakers of Jesus Christ, who is our life. Way number two a literal tree of life in the Garden of Eden with literal fruit. Without a doubt, way number one is the first and only way men have ever been able to receive eternal life. Way number two involves a physical, works-based path to salvation. But way number one is a spiritual path. Since God is unchanging, we believe the tree of life was a spiritual tree and not a literal tree that had literal fruit. Jesus was and is the tree of life. As Jesus said, He is the way, the only way to eternal life, and that has not changed. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And if Christ was and is the tree of life, then Satan or Lucifer was and is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Eternal life is in the sun. It is found nowhere else, so it could not have been in a literal tree. Proof number four of the serpent seed is, the serpent seed explains the purpose of the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. Have you ever wondered why Jesus Christ had to be born of a virgin? The doctrine of the serpent seed, which God himself originated in Genesis 3.15, reveals the mystery of the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. Since the fall of mankind came by sex, the redemption of mankind could only come without sex. The purpose of the virgin birth of Jesus Christ was for God to start a new race of humans, the born-again, Holy Ghost-filled Christians, because the original race had been corrupted or perverted through the seed of the serpent. Because the sex act of adultery was the first fruit of sin in the Bible, all men born of women were full of trouble or sin, because the sin nature would be passed down to them from their sinful mothers and fathers through a sex act. God's Lamb, His Son Jesus Christ, had to come to earth and be born through virgin birth to bypass the way sin came into the world. This is why Jesus could live a sinless life, because the sinful nature of man was not passed to him. Instead, the word nature of God passed through to him because he was conceived of the Holy Ghost. Remember that the Bible said the word was made flesh. Can you now see the purpose of the virgin birth? Since the fall of mankind came by sex, the redemption of mankind could only come without sex. Through the virgin birth of Jesus Christ, God was going to begin a new creation, or a new race of humans, starting with Jesus himself. For Jesus said he was the beginning of the creation of God, according to Revelation 3.14. St. Paul wrote that Jesus was the firstborn among many brethren, according to Romans 8.29 meaning that Jesus would first experience the filling of the Holy Ghost, which he received when the dove descended and remained upon him after his baptism at the River Jordan. And then Jesus' many brethren, or believers, would experience the same new birth that Jesus preached and pointed his followers to receive. St. Paul would teach that real Christians were new creatures, 
Their old habits and sinful lives were passed away because of the new birth. The Holy Ghost baptism would give all believers power over Satan's kingdom of darkness. Holy Ghost-filled Christians would still battle the sin nature inside of them, but would not become slaves to sinful habits and continue in a sinful lifestyle because they would have a greater person living inside of them, the Holy Ghost. True Christians will have Holy Ghost power to mature in holiness and perfect holiness in the fear of God, which is the image of His Son that we were predestined to be conformed into. The power and importance of the virgin birth is magnified in Revelation chapter 5, verses 1 to 10. As the only one who could open the book of redemption was the only one who came through a womb and was not born of a sexual act, the Lord Jesus Christ. No man or woman was worthy to loose the seven seals because they were all born in sin and shaped in iniquity. Moses, Noah, Elijah, Enoch, Joseph, Jacob, and Mary the mother of Jesus were not worthy to redeem mankind. Only Jesus Christ was worthy, the virgin-born Son of the living God. Jesus was prophesied to be the woman's seed of Genesis 3.15 that God said would bruise the head of the serpent on Calvary and by doing this, the sinless, spotless Lamb won the victory over sin for all mankind, past, present, and future. Thankfully, in the end times, the Holy Spirit promised to finish the mystery of God according to Revelation 10, verse 7, and this was to be done through the seventh angel, who we believe was Brother William Branham. Part of the mystery of God included the doctrine of the serpent seed. The doctrine of the serpent seed does not save anyone, for the doctrine of repentance and salvation is what saves people. But the serpent seed doctrine shines more light or revelation on what we are all trying to see, the absolute truth of the Bible and God's glorious plan of redemption. Now that this glorious revelation of the mystery of the virgin birth has been revealed to you and I, we can rejoice in the wisdom of God, as St. Paul did in Romans 11.33. Oh, the depth of the riches of both the wisdom and knowledge of God! How unsearchable are His judgments and His ways past finding out! Proof number five of the serpent seed is, after eating the fruit of sexual relations, Adam and Eve covered their loins or private parts. Did you notice that after eating of the forbidden fruit, which we believe was sexual relations, Adam and Eve covered their loins or private parts with aprons in shame? And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. In the Hebrew concordance, the word aprons means loin coverings. The loins are the area of the human reproductive parts. Eve first ate of the fruit, adultery with the serpent, and then shared that fruit with Adam, meaning she had sexual relations with him. After Adam and Eve partook of this fruit, both realized they were physically naked because the Bible teaches that whoredoms, or disobedient sex acts, would lead to the feeling of nakedness in Ezekiel 16 verses 35 to 41. Adam and Eve were so ashamed of their sin that they hid themselves from God in Genesis 3.8 because being naked involves feelings of shame according to the infallible Bible in Jeremiah 13, 26 and 27 and Nahum chapter 3, verse 5. We believe Adam and Eve covered their loins or private parts in shame because those were the body parts they used in the partaking of the fruit. Adam and Eve did not cover their mouths or sew hoods to cover their heads for they did not eat a literal apple, but instead they covered their private parts. If eating literal apples caused Adam and Eve shame to know they were naked, why can't we pass out apples today so that many worldly women will know they are dressed half naked? Furthermore, how can an apple open your mind to understanding and give you the awareness of the knowledge of good and evil and make you feel ashamed and naked? Eating apples today doesn't do that to people, and it did not do that in the days of Adam and Eve. But according to the Bible, sex acts done in disobedience and outside of the timing of God's perfect will do bring an awareness of evil and the feelings of shame and nakedness. Proof number six of the serpent seed is, God's punishment for Eve focused on sexual reproduction and her desire or longing for her husband. In Genesis 3.16, God issued a twofold punishment on Eve because she was deceived by the serpent into eating the forbidden fruit. 
Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. The first fold of God's punishment upon Eve was that she would experience multiplied or increased sorrow from the conception of children all the way to the delivery of children. Notice that the first consequence of Eve's sin focused on her sexual reproduction of seed or offspring. We can all recognize that throughout the Bible, God's punishments or consequences always fitted the crimes. For example, the Old Testament law of Moses taught punishments fit the crimes, such as eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, according to Exodus 21 verse 24. A second example would be David's sin of adultery with Bathsheba. Because David shed innocent blood, the sword of bloodshed would never depart from his house, according to 2 Samuel 12, 9 and 10. Because David laid with Uriah's wife privately, God would allow David's wives to be taken from him and laid with publicly before all Israel, according to 2 Samuel 12, 11 and 12. In the case of Eve's sin, God was no different than he was with Israel and David. The consequences of her sins fit her transgressions. The pain and suffering that all women experience in bringing forth seed or offspring is a constant, universal reminder from God to all of Eve's daughters that she willingly received or accepted the wrong seed in the beginning from the serpent. Because Eve broke her marriage covenant and received the wrong seed, she would experience suffering bringing forth any and all seed. Because Eve failed in the area of sexual reproduction, all women have increased suffering in sexual reproduction. If Eve had eaten a literal apple, why didn't God punish her mouth and all apple trees? Remember that God's punishments must fit the crimes, and in Eve's case, God's punishment focused on human reproduction and the body parts of the loins that are used for that process, which again proves Eve and Adam sin with their loins because they cover their loins immediately after eating because of the feelings of nakedness that go along with sexual sin. The second fold of God's punishment upon Eve was that her desire would now be upon her own husband. Again, as God's punishments fit the crimes, God was commanding Eve to desire or long for her own husband, which means that before God's command, Eve desired or longed for someone else and not her husband. We know it was the serpent and the fruit of adultery that Eve longed for, as Eve was guilty of longing or lusting after the act of adultery, because remember that the Bible says sin entered the world through her lust. It is important to notice in the scripture that Adam recognized that Eve was pregnant in Genesis 3 verse 20. Immediately after God identified the two separate seeds in Genesis 3:15. Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was already the mother of all living. Two seeds or children were already living and growing inside Eve's womb, and Adam recognized that Eve would be the mother of all living persons, whether they were good or evil. Proof 7 of the serpent seed is, the serpent was human-like before the fall. When you carefully study the scriptures about the serpent in Genesis 3, you will notice that he was very different than snakes are today. He was so different that he was human-like. First, the serpent was more subtle, which means shrewd, sly, or crafty, than any other beast of the field that the Lord had made. The serpent was the only beast we are aware of that God made with the ability to talk and to use intellectual reasoning, making him very close to a human being. That is why Satan selected the serpent to indwell and deceive Eve, for Satan was present in the garden of God and is known to possess animals and beasts. Second, the serpent was an upright creature before the fall, because after the fall, God cursed the serpent to go on his belly the rest of his days. The serpent was somewhat in between a chimpanzee and a man, but closer to a man, standing upright and able to carry an intellectual conversation with the deceived Eve. Third, the serpent had a seed that could and did mix with Eve's reproductive parts, causing her to conceive the serpent's own seed according to God in Genesis 3.15. When this happened, God cursed the serpent. He changed every bone in the serpent's body so that he had to crawl like a snake. Science can try all it wants to, and it won't find the missing link. God saw to that. 
Man is smart and he can see an association of man with animal and he tries to prove it out by evolution. There isn't any evolution. But man and animal did mingle. That's one of the mysteries of God that has remained hidden, but here it is revealed. It happened right back there in the midst of Eden when Eve turned away from life to accept death. We hope that your mental picture of what the serpent looked like in the Garden of Eden has now been changed to match the description given to us straight from the Bible. A human-like, upright standing creature with the ability to have an intellectual conversation with a human being. Proof 8 of the serpent seed is, Cain was not of Adam, but was of that wicked one, the serpent. According to the Holy Spirit, Cain was not the son of Adam, but was the son of the serpent, according to 1 John 3.12. Not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, and slew his brother. If the Bible teaches that Cain was of the wicked one, then Adam could not have been the wicked one John was speaking of. For the Bible also said Adam was a son of God in Luke 3, 38. This brings us to the truth of the two separate seed lines, the seed of Adam and the seed of the serpent. In the womb of Eve were two separate seeds, or sons, from separate impregnations. She was carrying twins with Cain's conception sometime previous to that of Abel's. To those who think that this is not possible, let it be known that the medical records are replete with cases where women have carried twins who were of separate ova and separate insemination, with the fertilization of the eggs being days apart, and not only so, but some of the records show that the twins were fathered by separate males. This is called heteropaternal superfecundation. Here is an article we found from the journal Forensic Science that validates heteropaternal superfecundation. Here is a case report from the Journal of Forensic Sciences, July 1994. The title of the case report is Paternity Identification in Twins with Different Fathers. The abstract reads, If a female has sexual intercourse with two males at short intervals within the same ovulatory period, superfecundation may occur. This article reports two cases of paternity identification in twins. The results showed that each twin had come from a different father. Thus, great attention should be paid to such a situation when the twin paternity identification is asked for. We believe God allowed this medical research to provide additional support to prove what actually happened in the Garden of Eden. That one female, Eve, had sexual intercourse with two different males, the serpent and Adam, at short intervals within the same ovulatory period, and produced twins that came from two different fathers, Cain from the serpent and Abel from Adam. These two separate seed lines have separate characteristics. The seed of Adam are blessed, and the seed of the serpent are cursed, because of their separate characteristics. Cain, the seed of the serpent, bore the full spiritual characteristics of Satan and the animalistic, sensual, or fleshly characteristic of the serpent. No wonder the Holy Spirit said that Cain was of that wicked one. He was. Cain was a liar and murderer, just like Satan. Furthermore, Cain was literally cursed by God, just like God cursed the serpent. In fact, all humanity that will be lost and sent to the lake of fire are called the cursed. God did not curse Adam or Eve. God only cursed the ground, for God cannot both curse and bless his children, according to Numbers 22, verse 12. Because Cain's cursed characteristics were so evil and contrary to God's obedient, humble nature, the Bible recorded Cain as having his own separate lineage in Genesis 4, verses 16 to 26. Adam's seed or lineage was completely separate from Cain's, as recorded in Genesis 5, verses 1 to 32. One point we want to emphasize about the two seed lines is that the physical genetic seeds of Adam and Cain are no longer separate because in the days of Noah, the literal seed of the serpent passed through the ark and has now intermingled with the godly seed. So all mankind are affected by the genetic pollution of the serpent seed. Since the flood of Noah up until today, God's seed or race are born of a spiritual seed and not a natural genetic seed. God's blessed seed are recognized by the fact that they receive and obey the full word of God and are born again of the Holy Ghost, according to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23. Proof number 9 of the serpent seed is, 
The seed of the woman was a literal man, Christ, and so was the seed of the serpent a literal man, Cain. Recall again that God himself said the serpent had a literal seed or human offspring according to Genesis 3.15. If we give credit to God in Genesis 3.15 that the woman did have a seed, then the serpent must surely have a seed also. If the seed of the woman was a man-child apart from the man, then the seed of the serpent will have to be in the same pattern, and that is another male must be born apart from human male instrumentality. There is no student who does not know that the seed of the woman was the Christ, who came by the instrumentality of God, apart from human intercourse, the virgin birth. It is also just as well known that the predicted bruising of the serpent's head was in actuality a prophecy concerning what Christ would accomplish against Satan at the cross. There at the cross, Christ would bruise the head of Satan, while Satan would bruise the heel of the Lord. As the seed of the woman was literally God reproducing himself in human flesh, so the seed of the serpent is the literal way that Satan found he was able to open the door to himself into the human race. It was impossible for Satan, for he is only a created spirit being, to reproduce himself in the manner which God reproduced himself. So the Genesis account tells how he produced his seed and introduced or injected himself into the human race. Also recall that Satan is called the serpent. It is his seed or injection into the human race we are speaking of. In closing, there is much more that can be taught from the Bible about the seed of the serpent. But we pray that what has been taught through these nine proofs of the serpent seed in this video series has helped shine more gospel light upon the original sin in the Garden of Eden. Again, we do not believe that someone has to understand and believe the doctrine of the serpent seed in order to be saved as the doctrine of repentance unto salvation leads true worshipers to eternal life. But we do believe that if someone is saved, sanctified, and also born again of the Holy Ghost, then they will surely see the truth of the original sin, because Jesus promised that the Holy Ghost would lead believers into all truth in John 16, 13. And the truth of the seed of the serpent is part of the full revelation of the Word of God. The truth of the seed of the serpent only shines light upon the glorious work of redemption through the virgin birth of Jesus Christ that we are all trying to see. Yo!